All right, everyone, welcome to our first RISE uh, Impact event, Closing the Digital Divide, a conversation about race, education, and tech. We are really excited that you're all here to join us, um, and we have some amazing content coming up in this event. My name is Kelsey Durafley, and I help in managing events and community programming at RISE New York. Um, and I want my colleague Alex to introduce herself and then tell you a little bit more about RISE. Thanks so much, Kelsey. And thank you to everybody for joining today. We're really excited to be kicking off the RISE Impact Series and looking to make this a more regular part of the programming at RISE. Um, so stay tuned for future sessions as well. Um, a little bit of background on myself. My name is Alex George. I work for the Barclays Ventures team. Um, the Barclays Ventures team's mission is to grow new businesses through next generation prop propositions and capabilities. And one of the ways that we do this is through our, our global RISE FinTech platforms. We like to call ourselves the home of FinTech because we have four locations globally. And across those sites, we have over 175 FinTech companies um, that are resident members in our spaces, as well as over a thousand members um, within those companies. Um, we really work with companies, FinTech companies across all stages of their life cycle. Um, from the very early stages from, with our female innovators lab by Barclays and Anthemis um, to this to early stages when the companies are developing their MVP and their minimum viable product um, through the Barclays accelerator powered by Techstars all the way up to series A, series B and exit um, where we really focus on the enterprise engagement piece. Um, at our global sites, we like to say that we're working to create the future of financial services by um, connecting and scaling with these companies. Um, and we hope that during um, you know, regular circumstances and when everybody can come back to the office, um, we'll see you there for our in-person events. Um, I'm gonna pass it off to Kelsey to introduce the panelists, but thank you again for joining the session um, and hopefully see you at future programming from RISE. Thanks, Alex. I am absolutely thrilled to introduce our panel. Um, I've been working with our panel the past couple months um, on curating this event, and I appreciate all of their very hard work um, that has gone into this. So our moderator is Yvonne Tevenote, founder and executive director at STEM Kids New York City. Our panelists include Amanda Gretza, educator at STEM Kids New York City, Stephanie Phils Noel, AVP Anti Money Laundering and Technical Project Manager at Barclays, Amaris Valdez, educator and AWS Cloud Ambassador, Jessica Boyd, Vice Principal of KIPP DC Connect Academy, and Titiana Lamaric student at KIPP College Prep High School and a participant at STEM Kids New York City. We're all really excited to have you guys here and I thank you for taking the time out of your day um, to discuss this important topic with us. To submit questions for Q&A, please go to www.slido.com and use event code 91106. Um, and one more note, we've placed everyone on mute um, as you come into the event, so please be mindful of unmuting yourself so we can avoid background noise. I will now pass it off to Yvonne to begin the discussion. Thank you so much. Thank you, Kelsey, and thank you, Alex. Um, good morning to everybody, and I just want to send you all, your, you, your family, your friends, and your, your whole community blessings of good health. Before we begin our panel on, of shared conversations of lived experiences, I wanted to provide you a background context to the origins of systemic uh, racism in education. Um, 60 years ago today, a peaceful group of students from the NAACP staged a sit-in at a Woolworths lunch counter in Jacksonville, Florida. They were beat by a mob of white residents in the town with baseball bats and ax handles. Hence, from that day forward, August 27th became Ax Handle Saturday. Victims shared that they ran to the police to break up the carnage. They were told by police to leave town or risk getting killed. A group of black men called the Boomerangs had attempted to protect the protesters and prevent the beatings. However, they were subsequently arrested by the police. Dr. Bettina Love, a prominent educator 
and founder of the Abolitionist Teaching Network, emphasizes that racism is violent, it systematically kills, destroys, and diminishes the dreams and real lives of Black, Brown, and Indigenous people everywhere in the United States. And it has been this way for centuries. Racism killed Breonna Taylor. Racism killed George Floyd. Racism almost killed Jacob Blake. Racism has killed the dreams of thousands of marginalized people who have been denied unemployment and educational opportunities because of their race. And this has resulted in a generation of economic wide or economic gaps so wide that it'll take about 200 years to close. Racism is a major factor in determining who will live and die from COVID-19, who gets hired, who gets the highest pay, and who gets referred to the choice programs in school, and who gets to live if stopped by the police. In our brief time today, I, I invite you to engage in active listening to the conversations with that I am terming counter narratives to racism. And while listening, I ask that you yourself reflect upon three things. One is where have I benefited from privilege in my life? The second is how has my upbringing shaped my ideologies about race and influenced my biases about groups of people different than me? The third is what actionable item, just one, can I do this year to reduce a social justice statistic created by racism? And then move forward with our panel. And that I gotta go work. There are no schools in the southern states of America that admitted Black people to its free public schools. White fears that Black literacy would prove a threat to the slave system. So laws were passed making it illegal for a slave to read or write. Slaves who were caught reading or writing were often beaten or killed. Whites who, caught, who were caught teaching a slave to read or write were also often beaten and were fined or jailed. Separate but equal was a legal doctrine in the United States in the 19th and 20th centuries. And it was further strengthened by the Supreme Court case of Plessy versus Ferguson in 1896, which allowed for state-sponsored segregation in all walks of life. Though segregation laws were existed before the Plessy case, that case codified legal systems that further marginalized Black people in disproportionate ways in education, employment, housing, the legal system, and the political system. This is the reason for the widening of the economic gap that still exists today and will last for centuries after us. Today in New York City, there exist stark disparities in employment and wages for Black New Yorkers. According to the Center for Urban Future in their August 2020 report, it reveals that Black New Yorkers hold a small share of the jobs in a wide variety or wide array of well-paying industries, not just in finance and technology, but also in the creative fields, construction, manufacturing, and business services. Black New Yorkers account for just 7% of the workforce in advertising, 7% in the securities industry, 8% in publishing, 9% in computer systems design, which happens to be the largest field within our tech sector, 9% in motion picture and video, 13% in legal services, and 16% in construction. According to the 2019 New York State Education Department Diversity Report, New York City schools are comprised of 80% of a teacher workforce that is white, whereas 10% of the teachers are black, and 9.4% of teachers are Latinx. Black New Yorkers make up 21% of the overall workforce and 22% of the city's population. And Latinx New Yorkers make up 29% of the city's population. And I wanted to share this in context because we didn't get here overnight where we are. And I wanted to share kind of the background so that if you weren't a history buff, you could get some of the history that we do have years to kind of erase and eradicate, and it won't just be through protesting and certain laws passed. It will take also a mindset for us to kind of go within to see how we as a people, as a community of people in the United States and across the globe will decide what 
social justice statistic we're going to decide to decrease so that little by little it becomes a way of life for us all to exist together. So I'm going to yield now to our panel as they answer questions I have so that they can share their brilliance through their lived experiences. So we'll begin. Okay, so the first question is, I want everyone to weigh in on this, this question and it'll give, the, it'll give the audience a context for who, how brilliant you are. So the first thing is, how is systemic racism seen in the educational system? And how does this impact students of color? And so, since we are not all together, and I can't just say, we'll just go one by one because you're not sitting beside each other, I'll start off with Stephanie, and then I'll just call on the panelists as we go. Okay. Thank you, Yvonne. Um, that was such a great segue. I, I'm so happy that you put things in proper context for us because we didn't just wake up and get here. Um, so, to me, success, systemic racism is it's more subtle and it's more nuanced than other forms of racism. It's not, I would say it's not as overt, you know, as someone calling you a derogatory term or, you know, treating you harshly. It's more uh, ingrained in our, in our school systems. Um, it affects our jobs, again, education, uh, the wealth gap. Um, I can speak from my own personal experience. Um, I can remember being in middle school. I was in about, I would say, I think it was seventh grade. And uh, I had a, a math class where I consistently scored over the 90th percentile on all of my um, math exams. And I remember, you know, raising the concern to my teacher saying that, you know, I, I did not belong in this class. And she basically, she, she blew me off for a while. And, um, you know, for, I would say the first few exams, I, you know, I, I went to the class, but then I eventually got demotivated and oftentimes would skip that class. I would, you know, go to an extra lunch period or make up an excuse and say that I wasn't feeling well or tell her that I needed to go to the nurse anything to just avoid being in the class and, and being bored. I would just show up on the days where I knew I needed to take the exam, take the exam, get, you know, a 95 or a hundred and, and then just move on. And then I eventually um, spoke to my guidance counselor about it. And I, real, I found out that there was actually a policy in place that if a student scored over the 90th percentile for I think a few one or two marking periods that they were supposed to be pushed to the next level and unfortunately I did not get that consideration and that didn't happen for me until the following year so um, you know that's that's an example of how systemic racism affects students of color and um, I'm a Haitian and American so I grew up um, with my grandmother who did not speak English at all. So I, I would say for those types of examples, you know, many immigrant parents or guardians are, you know, working and trying to get acclimated to a new country. So they don't necessarily have the time to come and advocate at their child's school for, for every little, um, you know, infraction. So I think that's why it's so important to have advocates it's in the educational system for, for students of color and for uh, immigrant families. Thank you so much. Amaris, uh, please share. Hey, um, uh, hey. Uh, so with me, I, I think in my upbringing, um, when I was a kid going to school, you know, th there were a lot of things that I wasn't aware of, right? So as a kid, you're not aware of what racism is or what systemic racism is. That's, you know, to me, that's a new term. So I learned about that term recently. But me growing up and thinking back, um, you know, some of the things that I realized are, for example, like overcrowding in, in the classrooms, right? And this leads to the instructors not being able to tend to the students. So I remember when it came to my teachers, I, I don't think I actually connected to any one of my teachers growing up in elementary school because I couldn't relate to them, right? And, and, and I think that's a, a big part right there because a lot of people, a lot of my friends growing up, you know, we didn't have parents that understood the system, they understood the financial system and things like that. 
uh, they just went to work because that's the only thing they could do, right? So they had to make sure that the, the household is maintained, uh, you know, there's food in, in the house and things of that nature. So when they came to the instructors and the teachers, you know, these are the people that are supposed to guide you. And as a kid, I couldn't relate to them. I couldn't speak to them in, in a personal level. And the other thing too is in terms of having, let's say, for example, just recreational activities, the only thing that we were able to do is just go to the basketball court and just play around with other kids in the neighborhood that, you know, parents are working, and they're not there in the home as well. And when it comes to, let's say, for example, if you want to do something different, you have to walk like probably a mile just to go to the community center so you can have access to a pool. And, it's, and again, it's overcrowded as well. So, you know, so these are the things for me, thinking back, that leads to a lot of kids not knowing what kind of opportunities are available to them and also not being able to connect with people that can help them guide them to, you know, just different possibilities and different opportunities that exist that they're not aware of. Thank you. And Jessica. Yeah, um, so I, I think I, just to, to ground everyone, um, obviously I went through schooling myself and I'm currently working in a school setting um, and hearing Stephanie and Amherst talk, um, they've already touched on kind of like the tracking system at play within education oftentimes kids get routed into a certain you know academic level in their education and they're just continued on that route regardless of their performance or their needs um throughout throughout schooling um, and then opportunity plays a plays a huge part in it as well um for myself i am um biracial i have a black father and a white mother um and so i grew up in a biracial family um all of that is to say, though, is that um, the, the factors at play with colorism and um, the color of my skin doesn't necessarily reflect that to everyone who sees me. So growing up, I knew about, you know, overt racism um, and like the historical context with which it was taught um, in our social studies or history classes. Um, obviously, we know that it was focused on like very acute events um, and it wasn't necessarily gone in as in depth as uh, the true history uh, is in our country. Um, and then I also had the history of my family and the perspective of my family at play, but systemic racism wasn't something that I was really thinking about growing up either. And, um, like I said, because of my, because of the way that I present to people and the color of my skin, it wasn't something that I felt like impacted me on an individual level uh, throughout my childhood. I, I definitely experienced more of the like overt racism, um, side of things. Um, but it just makes me think back to, for example, I went to a very, very diverse high school um, in a county that is known for its high performing schools, but is also known for having schools that are very segregated um, kind of by wealth and also uh, by race as well. And my school um, was definitely one of the more diverse schools, had a larger um, African American and immigrant population than most of the other schools. And I remember being in an AP history class my junior year of high school and um, my my teacher said, I'm going to give you uh, an option to come with me to a school board, a school council meeting um, and really practice your advocacy skills and see like what governing is like in our, our county. And so we were going there for the purpose of advocating for um, some emergency budget funds because the heat was out in a huge portion of our school. And so actually the location of my AP history class didn't have heat. And so we're sitting there in the middle of the school year, wearing hats, winter coats, gloves, um, and we were going to ask for additional funds. And so we go to this board meeting and we sit there and we all go up and we talk and we share um, about the importance of obviously heat in our school. Um, and then right after us, one of the other primarily white wealthy schools in our, in our county came up and was also asking for extra money because their weight room wasn't adequate and they needed more weight machines um, to meet their needs. And I just remember for the first time thinking and, and talking to my father on the way home, like, wow, that's like, that's, that's a huge difference. We're asking for, you know, a standard of living here. We're asking for heat in our school and they're asking for this, like, something that's not necessarily a need, but a want, like weight machines. And I think that was the first time that I really thought deeper about how is this, you know, successful, well-known county um, supporting all of its all of its citizens and students? And I think that was the first time that it really hit me that you know things weren't as as equal or equitable as as things are often portrayed to people. So, thank you, and Amanda. 
So um, growing up in New York City, I think as a kid, you don't think about the diversity as much. I mean, we're considered this beautiful melting pot. So, you know, there, there's people of all color around all the time and that's wonderful. But there's definitely upon reflection, this sort of interesting trickle down effect that, that I observed. So public school as a really young kid, you know, first grade, second grade, it was just regular. There's kids everywhere, you're doing this, great. But as I progressed in years and started going to more advanced schools, um, you know, I went to a, a gifted middle school, the diversity kind of stopped. You know, there was less and less people of color involved um, and not just for the students, but for the teachers as well. Um, and I, I thought about this question a lot before coming in here and I can think of two black teachers that I had in high school and middle school. And that's it. And, you know, as an educator now, I'm looking back on that and I'm, I'm wondering what, what chance did the children of color have when the only faces that they were witnessing that were in authority looked nothing like them. And they just were, that, that's all that they were stuck with. And, you know, that, this one black woman was a biology teacher in high school and she was amazing. And, to see a black woman in a STEM field is rare even now. So it's kind of interesting to reflect on that and, and say, you know, I wonder what it was like for those kids who maybe could have pursued a STEM field or, you know, a different field, but then they felt like, hey, this isn't my place for this. I, I don't really see myself in this arena because they weren't even given a choice to see themselves. Thank you. And then last but not least, I'd like Tatiana um, who's just getting started in high school, but Tatiana, I'd like you to reflect on just your time in school to see if you um, have experienced or seen or been aware of anything that's remotely called systemic racism. Um, as the beginning of, beginning being in high school, I look back at the times when I was in elementary school and middle school, I can remember only the only Caucasian people I knew were the teachers. And there wasn't that many teachers that were Caucasian, but it was like at least a little bit diverse. And in the past in elementary school, I didn't really remember. Like I I didn't really remember, but all I remember is that I didn't really know racism back then. I had an IEP that gave me um a disadvantage and it stopped still sixth grade. I think the problem with the problem with um, schools now compared and schools in the past is that they separate Caucasians and people of color into private and public schools, giving them a lack of diversity and a lack of them to understand racism together and try to fix it together. Thank you. Okay, so now I'm going to uh, turn our attention to some specific questions that I'll ask just certain panelists to respond to, but all of you will have equal, equal air time, if you will. Um, so, and, and, and audience, my friends on the audience, I know the title says closing the, 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 the divide or closing the digital divide, but in light of the, I guess, the space and time that we're in in our lives, and the news that has been permeating, you're going to hear systemic racism kind of filter through this whole um, event. And I and I just invite you to just feel comfortable in the discomfort, because the word racism oftentimes brings about discomfort, and it's just a normal thing to do. But I think if we spend some time talking about it and and saying the name, and and then you hear these lived experiences of it, it'll allow us to be a little bit more comfortable in the discomfort. So hence why you're gonna hear systemic racism bandied back and forth, okay? So another question, systemic racism. So how has systemic racism in the educational system impacted the technology and startup communities? I first like Stephanie to address that and then Jessica. Sure, so 
there's there's a huge impact. Um, I, I I'd say that there's a direct causal relationship between systemic uh, racism in education and technology in the startup communities. Um, it's so for example, this summer um, I've been mentoring a an outstanding woman of color in technology. She's phenomenal. Like any company would be lucky to have her, and you know her experiences that she described to me were very similar to what I experienced almost 20 years ago, graduating college. So for people of color that actually make it into the technical programs at their universities, it's extremely difficult to um, get proximity to professors, um, teaching assistant roles or proctor roles. Those, those roles oftentimes lead to other roles or internships. So um, there, I would say that there is a, a huge, um, you know, a discrepancy there. Um, in my, you know, in my time in college, I found it extremely difficult to uh, find opportunities outside of my university because oftentimes people that came to talk to our university, they had their own networks already established. So for people of color, it's they're oftentimes on the outside of those networks and they don't really have inroads to them. Thank you. And Jessica, you are um, vice principal uh, within a school, great charter school network. Can you share uh, what you and your staff do to allow for opportunities or what you're doing to address the lack of opportunities? In sure, yeah. Um, of course, so obviously I don't have the, the career side of things um, as, as a hands on experience, but I definitely um, see it in in my my daily work. Um, first, I want to be completely transparent that Connect Academy is an early childhood school. So our campus goes through 8th grade, um, but I specifically uh, work with the early childhood portion of the school. Um, so my kiddos are very, very little. Um, and so they're, they're right at the beginning of their educational experience here, which we think is super important and foundational. Um, and so kind of referring back to what Stephanie said earlier um, in kind of getting children exposed to tech and STEM um, and like the joy and love of it. Um, the first and foremost, I think most important thing is, you know, opportunity and exposure and uh, Stephanie was referring back to kind of kind of being stuck in certain classes and certain curriculums um, within our school system. I think that's the first thing is what opportunities are we giving students, especially students of color, um, to be exposed to, you know, this coursework in STEM and in tech. Um, and so at a very young age at my school, we start our blended learning programs. And um, that can look like, you know, students doing um, academic software on an iPad or on a Chromebook. Currently in this space, it looks like them taking all of their classes um, over Zoom or in this virtual space. Um, so, so kids are definitely getting exposed to technology, um, but it's really about fostering that um, comfort and, and joy. And I think that's a huge, huge part of, of increasing the number of students of color that we see who have an interest in this space, but also feel like they're being supported in this space. And I want to reference something specific. I think in education, you hear a lot about the achievement gap. Um, and we say, oh, there's this big achievement gap between um, white middle class students, and students of color, um, students who are living and experiencing poverty. Um, and within those spaces, we often say, oh, to close this achievement gap, we need to give students all of this access to all this academic content. And we almost hone in too much on, you know, they need to have more time with math and more time with reading and more time with writing and literacy. And we sometimes like throw out all of the other um, important content areas like STEM or like tech. It seems like it's in addition to these foundational academic skills. Um, so I think one of the big things that um, has been really important in the last few years is looking and saying, sure, maybe we have this achievement gap. Oftentimes it's very much an opportunity gap there, um, whether that's access to, you know, preschool programs um, that will help kids be better prepared for kindergarten, um, which is the space that my school is in, pre-K and kindergarten. Um, but it's also thinking about how we can provide students with that um, intensive instruction around those, those core subjects while also, you know, 
it sounds bad, but like the proper word is allowing them to have the same exposure to this coursework and extracurricular content um, that their white middle class peers are experiencing. So I think that's the big shift that um, the past few years we've tried to say like, you know, as my Angelo said, has said previously, and this is a abbreviated quote, when you know better, do better. So now that we kind of have had the system in place, how are we now changing that system to really meet the whole child in like a very genuine and authentic way? Great, thank you. And at STEM Kids NYC, we start at pre-K also. So yes, we have fun. Love that, um, come on down to DC. Yeah, yeah engineering <laughs> classes to children as young as three. And um, we even had a, um, you know, we did K when uh, we all, were all sheltered in place and they did remarkably well learning how to code via Zoom. So they, they're masters in Zoom already. So yeah. <laughs> Thank you. So is there equal access to technology for students? You know, you heard Jessica share a little bit about what her school was intentional in doing to start as young as pre-K, which is awesome. But just when we look across the, the horizon, is there equal access? And Tatiana, I want you to start with that. Is there equal access to technology in school? As a KIPP student, I noticed that there's like a difference between public, charter, and private schools. Um, due to the fact of funding, donors, and the fact that the fact that they were struggling with like funding and stuff. Sorry, I'm a little shy. No worries. Doing great though. Uh, first of all, I'm impressed that you even started off that way because I was just like, hold up here. You should be moderating this, but go ahead. <laughs> so, due, so due to the fact that there's a different amount of donors and a different amount of funding, Access to technology is based on the how much money each school type has been getting. Like I, I know like my brother is trying to go to a private school and I checked his private school and I noticed how like fancy it is and how much rooms there are. And I was like, wow, this is different. This is new. And being a charter kid student, I was like, I noticed a lot of differences. I mean, I like KIPP College Prep. It's like huge, but I barely got to see it because due to quarantine and stuff. So I was quite shocked that I saw the difference between a private school and a charter school. Thank you. And Jessica, I'm gonna turn this back over to you again and just have you weigh in as an educator about sure. this access. Yeah, well, first, I just want to echo what you, you said earlier, Tatiana, you are on it. I'm so impressed um, and I was so happy to see that you're a Kipster. Um, you're obviously up in Kip, New York, which is different, a bit different than Kip DC down here. But um, I'm so already impressed by your answers because when I was in ninth grade, I would not be able to answer these questions to any great extent. So um, I, what Tatiana said is, is literally spot on. So much of this has to do with funding when it comes to schools providing tech to students, but it also has to do with um, what students already have in their home environments um, and whether or not the students have access to Wi-Fi or to um, tablets or computers at home. Um, and that's something that we've really had to address during this virtual learning space is do our kids have what they need to be successful? And I think one of the positives that's come out of this is that schools have really had ha, have really had to think more about that. What do our kids have access to at home, and has our education system already been, you know, equitable in you know the work that we're assigning kids to do at home if they didn't have access to Wi-Fi or a computer previously? So it's really forcing us to, to look deeper into this. Um, I will say down here at KCC, we have sent home over 7,000 Chromebooks with families, um, which has been a huge, I give and shine to our, our tech team because they have had to not only purchase additional Chromebooks, but set them all up for all of our students in a way that um, is somewhat accessible and easy to log into all these different applications that students are currently using. So 
we have sent home over 7,000 7, Chromebooks to all of our students pre-K three to 12th grade. Um, and with that, we are also providing hotspots to families who don't have access to Wi-Fi. We've seen a big increase since the spring in the amount of families who need Wi-Fi uh, wi -Fi hotspots at home, um, probably just having to do with the amount of time that um, we've been in this pandemic, a lot of job loss and decreased uh, government assistance right now. Um, not to mention Wi-Fi is incredibly pricey to begin with. I was joking the other day in a meeting that even my Wi-Fi bill is like, absurdly high um, and so we just have to think more about the accessibility to families um, in this space and and we as schools are, uh, really need to make sure that we're meeting these those needs um, but as was mentioned you know different schools have different capacity to do that um, specifically kip dc I, I i checked in yesterday we're planning on spending about six million dollars just on tech for students this school year so it is an incredibly expensive venture supporting all of our students, but it's obviously a huge priority um, because everyone does not have this the same opportunity and exposure um, and accessibility to technology in their home environments. Um, and now that being in school isn't, isn't um, a factor, it's definitely something that, that has to be done. Thank you. And so it's, it, we've heard from two um, people from, from KIPP. Um, <clears throat> And Amari, you work in uh, the public school sector, and you might you might see things, you know, from a different lens or equal. I'd love for you to share if if there is an equal access to technology for for all students, Amari, what can be done or what is being done to help with that within that public school setting. So, I mean, I would speak from my experience, right? Because I know that the. Uh, the DOE, the New York City Department of Education is the largest school district in the world. So it's, it's, I can't speak for everyone. From my experience though, I do work in a CTE school, a Korean technical education school. So our school has technology. Uh, we, you know, we teach advanced concepts. We teach our Cisco certification. We teach our Amazon web services. So we do have a lot of technology that we offer to our students. But uh, as Jessica said though, for our population, what we notice is the technology at home. Do they have access to technology? Do they have access to hotspot internet? Do they have a computer at home? You know? So it does limit a lot of students, but also I, I think more in the system wide level, uh, they don't have technology subjects that are of interest to the students. So let's say for example, when I went to school, I went to a regular uh, academic high school and uh, the only access to technology I had there was, you know, to use Microsoft Word, Microsoft Excel, and this was an outdated version of it. So, you know, it, it's not really fun. It was more, it was meant for an enhancement to, uh, to English class and writing and things of that nature. It wasn't for exploring or to see, you know, what, what can you do with this computer system? What can you do with this technology? How do you have fun with it? So it's, it's a little bit different for other schools. But for my school in particular, we do have access to advanced concept and technology and our kids, they are amazing at it. The only thing I would say though is uh, they don't have access to the same opportunities, right? They don't have access to the resources in terms of the people, right? They don't have access to that network. They don't know what to do after they graduate. I have a graduating class that have these advanced certification every single year, but they don't have the opportunity to apply for internships and actually get those internships. So they don't get the opportunity to actually apply what they learn in class. And I think that's really what we're missing in terms of the CTE world. But in terms of the rest of the school system, yes, I do believe that uh, they do lack technology in, in, in the whole wide system. School. Great, thank you. And Amanda, you, you and I teach in, in a lot of public schools, at least pre COVID, <laughs> we did. Uh, tell me your thoughts on this equal access. So I think this is a, actually a very prominent example of that trickle down racism, uh, the systemic racism. Um, you're a lot of schools, a lot of public school systems, a lot of school boards, they tend to view technology and STEM subjects as sort of a bonus. You know, like, you know, it would be great if we had a nice computer lab and a maker space, but that's, you know, that's just some extra fun stuff for the kids, but it's not. And you combine the lack of technology available in schools plus the lack of technology available at home, you are taking a group of people who already are, you know, starting out behind and you're limiting them even further. So 
technology in this day and age, it's just as crucial as teaching someone to learn to read. You know, there's going to be so many issues if you take a young child and then expect them to enter the workforce without any of these tools that every single one of their peers have had access to, you know? And I mean, if we're being realistic right now, you know, we're having a conversation using technology. Our, our entire life society, as we know it, depends on using technology. So when you are asking a child to then go about their life and then not giving them the tools to function as an adult, you can't expect anything good to happen. Um, and I think that it's not just, I mean, we, we've briefly discussed funding and grants and those are great, but at the end of the day, you can't just throw money at a problem and say, okay, we have tech in the schools now, this is great. You need to really fundamentally change how you're teaching technology and how you're putting this emphasis on, you know what, the world is tech. We should learn how to think critically in, in a technical environment. You should learn how to experiment, take risks. And that's only done by making sure you have a budget for pop proper training and making sure that, you know, if you do do things like allow your children to take home laptops, you make sure they know how to use them. You know, it's all about getting that education in. So don't just say, here's a computer kid. Good luck. You know, you're working from home now. You just say, okay, here's how we can use Zoom. Here's some fun free programs that you can experiment on. Don't be afraid to make an app or uh, some crazy 3D model that would never actually print on a 3D printer. So it's a mix of making this big paradigm shift of, hey, tech is the future, tech is necessary, but also making sure they know how to use it and making sure the teachers know how to use it too. Um, unfortunately, I, I feel like I've noticed there's just not enough of a budget for teachers to learn these advanced technology, technological skills that are necessary these days. So I think that's a big thing. Like teachers need to have access to this stuff as well. You know, it's, it's very important. All right, thank you. I'm gonna turn it over to Stephanie. <clears throat> Let's get into the, the corporate side of things a bit. Um, what can employers do to, I would say probably address bias but then particularly on the hiring side and, and make choices to ignore it or get rid of it so that they are not exercising exclusivity when recruiting for technology-based roles. Thanks, Yvonne. Um, so first I would say that, um, you know, hiring managers really do take some time and really do some self-reflection and look around and, and examine, you know, why their teams in many instances look exactly like them. That's first things first, and, and that's very difficult to do. Um, and then I would say from, an, from a human resources perspective, I think there needs to be task force that are created that specifically look at ethnicity. Because within technology, there are quite a few um, people of color, but there, that word or that phrase people of color, it doesn't really, it oftentimes doesn't include black people or doesn't really include women. So I think, um, you know, HR departments really need to drill down, really look at the number of women, the number of black people, the number of Hispanic people. I think because of that intersectionality, oftentimes, you know, black women, and people of color kind of get lost in the shuffle. And then another thing I'll say is that when when recruiting, I believe that companies should send, you know, a person of color that actually is technical and doing the job. So the feedback that I've received from some of my mentees is that oftentimes, you know, they meet someone who's from HR and the person has a blurb on a sheet about what the role is, but that person doesn't necessarily know anything about technology or you know, might not be a technical person. So I think that a true, represent, a true representative of the group from the team should be there to talk to potential students and to attract talent. And, and as a black person, that's always the first question that you have. When you're, you know, you go into a place, you, you're scanning the room, you're looking around, at least in my case, it's like, am I going to be the only one? And in many cases, that that's typically how it's been in my experience. Thank you. 
And so I'm going to turn this uh, first question over, this next question, over to Tatiana first, and then I'll, I'll have Amanda and Amari share. But um, let's talk a little bit about technology-focused programs um, that do give students of color opportunities. And Tatiana, I'd like for you to, to share just, you know, I, I know that you are, have been in STEM programs before you started it with STEM kids in YC. So I'd like for you to share kind of your experiences of having exposure to uh, technology-based programs or STEM-based programs for a second. Um, I went to Lego Robotics and Lego Robotics was pretty fun. I managed to make a lot of new friends. We talked about problems also, and we figured out ways to solve it. And what I noticed between the, the STEM program of Lego Robotics and STEM Kids NYC is it has a lot of similarities. And my Lego Robotics team ended up getting a golden ticket to go to City College to introduce our problem and show our robotics and coding skills. We didn't win, but it was it was a lovely experience. Especially since I was like the founder of the first KIP Lego Robotics in NYC in KIP Infinity at least. And what I noticed still is that I still haven't noticed like any diversity. Like both of them, I noticed that there was both people of color and Hispanics, but I rarely got to see Caucasians. And that's like a huge problem because how are we supposed to end racism if we can't figure out how to solve diversity? Thank you. And so Tatiana, I'm gonna have you queue up your, uh, the app that you made, Social Justice app, um, and I'll turn it over to Amari's to, while you queue that up, to answer the question, uh, access to technology or these technology-based programs that have been created for students of color. So, uh, so I, I, I grew up in the Bronx, I grew up in uh, South Bronx in the projects there, and uh, the, so I am a strong proponent of CTE schools. So if you have access to CTE school and you can send your kids to CTE school, I would definitely recommend that. That's the first thing, right? Second thing is Year Up. Um, there is an organization called Year Up, and this is something that I, I completely love this organization because of the many students that I have, many mentees that I have that I actually mentor as well, that went through this program, they got jobs at JP Morgan Chase and other Fortune 500 companies. Um, and it's free, completely free. Uh, Perscolas, that's another one. That's a big one in the Bronx where it's, it's, it's a community center where they actually get people to come in. They learn different skills, uh, technology skills, programming, network engineering skills. And it's completely free for any residents that, that lives in the Bronx. Um, Pursuit, that's another one that I actually met the founder of this program. And what he does is similar. So he teaches people how to become programmers and how to get into technology. And also he tries to get them a job and what they have to do is they have to give them like 10% of the salary for two years. Um, and after that, they get to keep whatever, you know, whatever the money that they're making at that point. Again, the connection that they have is tremendous in terms of the Fortune 500 companies and just mentors that actually go there and help out the students there. And then the last one I'm going to mention is Empower. This is an organization that we have been working with as well in the school. Um, and, and there are tons of other organizations. I used to work in a public li library. And that's one thing that I noticed about the library that in your public library that they have a lot of resources available to people. Um, a lot of different organizations that list their uh, services there. So I would definitely recommend anyone to go to the New York public library or any library close to you and ask the librarian what kind of resources can they take advantage of. And then lastly, Khan Academy and YouTube. Uh, these are things that I use every single day to learn new skills. Um, these are invaluable resources and, and it's free. You know, as long as you have internet access, these are definitely things that you can go to and just watch as many videos as you want. Thank you. Okay, Tatiana, I'd love for you to share with uh, the audience family what some of what you've been working on through STEM Kids NYC's summer program, virtually. Um, this is my app. I decided to talk about inequality and in income. 
decided I decided to talk about it because I I thought about the communities and then like the funding in each community and I think it ties back to like like school and like based on the community it depends on what kind of school either one is public charter or private schools will be in that area and I know I went to a lot of communities and I had so many schools and I know there's like a few differences. Um, this is my logo. I drew it myself and I decided to upload it. I added this, which is a data plot of like, I decided to talk about in inequality and income by race which is also a problem because many problems that we talk about now has to tie back to racism, like income, education. And this is a bigger, this is a bigger um, version of the logo. There's also music, but I muted it, so. Okay, thank you. And um, can you tell uh, the audience a little bit about <clears throat> the STEM and social justice program that you participated in, just so that they can get a context as why this happened? Um, so, so basically about like the program that I've been doing for the past few weeks, we were learning about activists, young activists, and we were focusing on our app. The goal for the end of the internship was to create an app about your a social economic problem. And I chose income. A lot of other people chose other things, but I thought about income a lot. So I decided to choose income. Great. Thank you so much. And just so um, audience, so you know, this, this app was created in JavaScript. So Tati, you're going to learn JavaScript uh, as well as the other uh, teams that she was a part of in the program because um, we try to make sure that we are relevant and current in technology so we only teach current technology um, to our students so that they could make sure that they have that foundation for being marketable if they choose to decide to go into tech so thank you so much tatiana for that we have about um i have about seven minutes that i'm going to actually a little less than so i'm going to skip around a little bit and ask a, maybe one more question. And I'd like for you all to kind of keep your responses even more succinct, um, just so that we have some, some, some time for Q&A. So I, the next question that I'd like to um, kind of go into is, let's, let's, let's reflect on the coronavirus pandemic that we are all experiencing and how, and this is where I want all of you to weigh in on it, um, but just be very succinct in your responses. How has uh, the coronavirus virus pandemic amplified the conversation around inequity, access uh, to technology for students of color? And Tatiana, I'm gonna have you start and then I'll just turn it over to the rest of the panelists to weigh in. So when you were had to shelter in place, you're starting ninth grade, Tatiana, you haven't even been able to start actually being on campus because you're taking your classes online. Classes have already started. So uh, I, I, I thank you for um, stepping out of your, your class to, uh, to join us. And uh, but please share with us, how, how has the, the pandemic um, illuminated this access to technology from say your peer standpoint? I mean, due to the, due to like increase in funding because Something that Jessica said was they were passing out Chromebooks. I had to actually pick up my Chromebook. And it's the same Chromebook I was using during remote learning in March. Um, especially since my birthday was around that time, it was kind of hard and difficult. I was lucky that I wasn't like, I was lucky that I got honor roll during remote learning. And I know it's a lot of things, 
like we have to switch a lot for like the goods of learning because we changed from Google Classroom to Canvas and it's so hard to use it right now, but I'm kind of getting used to it. Zoom, especially since Zoom costs money over time. I found that out and I was shocked. And classes, it's kind of hard to get used to, especially since your middle school and elementary school years wasn't in remote. But it will be extremely harder for kindergarten students and pre-K students because I can't imagine how hard it would be for you to do remote learning. And especially since it's your first time in education. And I remember what my mom said about it. She said that it was kind of traumatizing, like imagining it over and over again about you doing remote learning and barely getting to know these people, like it's contact. It's kind of is. Thank you. And Jessica, please share. Um, again, I'm just not in everything you say. I'm like, wow, you have so much perspective on everything. Um, yeah, so it, being somebody who is in the pre K kinder education space, um, you are definitely correct. Such, it's an age group that really thrives on hands on learning, um, which is really hard to do through a computer screen. Um, so we've had to think a lot about how we can you know, use technology to support our kids in the best way possible. So we are doing virtual classes that are live and we're doing recorded classroom uh, classes as well. In addition to using different uh, technology um, software is like Seesaw, which allows us to kind of create these lessons where kids can, you know, record their voices or, or do it in a uh, live time and record it and send it to teachers so they can give feedback around it. Um, so we've had to come up with lots of different ways for kids to still um, show their learning and also um, have some opportunities to actually do the learning part and not just sit and get, and get lectured through it through a screen. Um, I think another thing that comes to mind in this in this tech space is um, I, I already mentioned that it's really forced us to say like what do our kids have access to at home and it's really um, required us to support them more with providing tech in the home space. We're doing a bunch of webinars where parents so they can learn about all the different softwares that are happening. Um, and at this age group, our teachers are in Zoom classes actively. Like, like this week, our teachers are focusing on modeling for students and showing students through Zoom how they can mute and unmute themselves during calls, which is incredible that, like, you know, four year olds are practicing this, this kind of thing that adults obviously are still kind of getting the hang of. Um, but also services like the wraparound services, the mental health services that we provide through our schools, um, figuring out how to do those in the virtual space, um, and then kind of going back to it being kids' foundational learning experiences is just that relationship building that's so important. Um, it's much harder to do through a computer screen, but definitely a primary focus of ours. Okay, uh, thank you so much, Jessica. I'm gonna pause for a moment, um, just because um, we are running out of time. And I'm going to just, first of all, thank you so much, panelists, my panelist friends, for the brilliance and perspective that you brought that I truly feel that it was so personal. So I appreciate you were um, sharing your lived experiences through these questions. I'm going to turn it over to you, some Q&A, because there's some questions that have been asked in the, in the portal. Um, one of them is, and this is for anyone to just, jump, or I'll just actually point, what would the, you suggest are the biggest needs that could be provided by the general public to battle racism in the STEM education community. And I'm going to ask Amanda to share that answer. So that's a great question. Um, I think the first thing that anyone looking to make a difference can do is to start the conversation. Um, you know, it's it's I think it's hard to say, oh, you know, I'm racist or oh, I, I'm stereotyping people or or whatever fault, but you need to acknowledge that there are these systemic flaws and you know you may you might contribute to that. Um once you start that conversation, you also need to, you know, get involved in your communities, in your schools, in your local organizations. Um basically once you start that conversation, you can say, hey, kid, what, what, what kind of things are you interested in? And they're not going to be able to tell you these advanced technology things because they haven't seen them yet. So 
get involved in their organizations, um, give them exposure to different technologies, devices. Uh, if you have a company and you're interested in kind of putting yourself out there, it would be amazing if you could, you know, either start a presence in the school or open up internships or maybe like visit the company for a day programs when things are stable, et cetera. Even over Zoom, it would be great to, you know, show these kids who haven't had exposure to these things what this great opportunity is for them, you know? Start that conversation with them and listen to them and then, you know, show them the things that they can do. I think that's that's honestly the best step is is literally just showing them what they could be capable of. You know, the kids are interested in everything in the world, but they're not going to start getting into coding if they don't know what coding is. So show them. Thank you, Amanda. So, Kelsey, I'm going to ask um, you that we, we have uh, one question. Actually, two questions in the in the portal, but I'm going to turn it over to you because we're now at 1101. So you you guide me. I follow your lead. Yeah. Sure. Why don't you Why don't you ask those two questions if you are able to stay? We'd love you to stay for another um, five minutes or so. That would be great. Okay. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. Um, one thing is, uh, Tatiana, by far, you're the, you're the star of this panel. Um, that was a response, a comment that there were many people that uh, agreed with that. So I needed to share that specifically. So another question is, what are some of the strategies in engaging parents and guardians in a student's education, particularly if technical topics um, are you know, kind of part of this education fabric, but the background knowledge may be limited. So, Jessica, I, you know, you're, you're in DC. I don't know what area in DC that you're in. My brother also teaches at Eli, Eli uh, EF, EL Haynes. Um, so, he too is a charter school math teacher. Tell us what are some of the strategies or tactics that you have put together with your team to bring parents into the fold if they don't themselves have the economic or academic knowledge uh, to, 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 sure, to yeah. help the child. Yeah. Um, I do know Eel Haynes well, so I do know exactly where your, where your brother's working. Um, just as like a, a quick answer to this, this question, um, I think historically in the past, we always try to introduce families to the curriculum that we're teaching because we are the first few years of school and we want them to have a say and a role in, in their students' learning. Um, so we always have you know, in-person events um, like back to school nights and um, different nights where they can have seminars where they're learning about the actual content that their kids are learning in school. Um, I think for any parent, it's, it's something new that they don't quite know because for a lot of us as adults, we're like, oh, you know, you just learn to read. But like you don't actually remember all the steps that breaks down into. So um, historically, we we've, we've always done um, sessions and seminars and things for our families to get more familiar with the content and kind of learn the strategies behind teaching it. Um, we've had to do that in this virtual space as well. Um, like I said, do a lot of webinars that are actually teaching families. This is how you access Zoom. This is how you use you know a clever app, which gives kids access to all these different things. Um, and so I think overall, it's kind of, we're all learning about this together because I was gonna say we're experts in this. You guys are actually experts in the tech space. We are not. Um, and so we're all kind of learning side by side. We'll do like teacher trainings on the tech. We'll do family trainings on the tech. Um, and by teachers, I mean like all staff because I'm learning it as well. Um, but just lots of, um, lots of sessions uh, via Zoom as much as possible. And then also uh, connecting families with our tech team so that they can get some one on one support as well if necessary. Great. Thank you. A comment was made um, on just it, it appears that charter schools, uh, you know, only one is represented here, uh, but charter schools appear to have that answer to kind of these broad based questions or issues that are, are in our space in education that you've done very well at and, and quite frankly, in charter schools, yes money is put towards those problems, but the results have been so much, I would say, greater, if you will, in terms of academic achievement and the well-being of the child compared to other aspects in education. And that's a political thing in and of itself that we probably need another session to discuss. Um, so I'll just leave it there. Um, the one thing, uh, there was a comment or a question 
as it relates to um, how to, you know, what can people in the general public do to battle systemic racism in the STEM community? And I know it was answered. The thing I'll also just kind of share with you from my two cents is that um, if when you decide to volunteer, when you decide to participate in different aspects to help children, help groups, and so on to plug into here, or even mentor, you know, people within the Rise, um, Rise family to help a fintech startup get get going. Um, it, I would kind of just say it'll be important to just reflect upon your lived experiences and get to know the people that you are, are connected with and understand their lived experiences. Because a child who might come uh, supposedly rough attitude probably has a story, <laughs> you know, and it probably stems from some experiences that he or she had. For all you know, before they got to your offices for mentoring, they were stopped by the police and roughed up or just civil rights, you know, you know, violate it, and that's going to make anyone angry and upset and so on. So it, it'll be important to kind of pause before you get into the business of things to just understand from whence people are coming from, understand those experiences, and maybe you you have you both have some shared experiences that that that's where a culture and a connection can be started. So I'd probably say just a suggestion: start there first before getting into the the business at hand. Okay. So in closing. I just want to thank, you know, first of all, thank Barclays, the, 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 whole, the whole company for having such a wonderful um, interdepartment group. I don't know what you call it as rise to have such an event as this. Um, and then I definitely want to thank our brilliant panelists for taking the time uh, to take us on a journey of your own lived experiences and insight that has been quite informative um, through your own connections in your own life. And I hope that all of you in my audience as friends um, have taken away something for yourself that you have some pieces of information to reflect upon and that you can yourself can go inward and evaluate a bit of where you are so that you can make a choice to reduce a statistic related to social justice um, in education in tech or within your own community so i wish you all well uh, during the remainder of our pandemic and I'll turn it back over to, to Kelsey. Thank you, Yvonne. I wanna give you a huge thank you for being here today um, and for um, putting together these questions. It was such a wonderful conversation and I think we're all able to take something um, with us uh, from the conversation. So thank you to our panelists um, and to Yvonne um, and Hey, Tiana, thank you for being here and showing us your app. You really were the star of the conversation. So I want to give you a round of applause virtually. Um, and to all of our panelists and, uh, and moderator, of course. So thank you for being here. Um, we'd love to join you. We'd love for you to join our future Rise events um, and hope to see you all soon. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you.